Hello, everyone. Welcome to the machine learning course through SIGGRAPH Frontiers program. And before we begin, I just want to read this uh, ACM SIGGRAPH policy against harassment. So this live stream is moderated by ACM SIGGRAPH, and we ask that all comments stay respectful of others and respect ACM's policy against harassment. This means uh, please exercise consideration and respect in your speech and actions, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your fellow participants. That said, let's uh, begin. So I am Rajesh Sharma. Um, I work at the Walt Disney Animation Studios and I'll be teaching this course. And for this particular course, uh, I hope you can see my slides. There you go. So this is uh, class one. And um, this course itself is made possible by ACM SIGGRAPH. And there are a number of people I would like to thank in the beginning. Paul Jeremiah Svila, the SIGGRAPH 21 chair. Uh, Thomas Bernards, who is the Frontiers program chair, who's organizing all of this that you see here today. Alex Bryant, the student volunteers chair. Tim Hendrickson, digital marketing manager. and a uh, number of student volunteers who have agreed to help us out here uh, moderating the comments and answering your questions and funneling the questions and comments to me as well. So thank you to all of them and uh, let's uh, begin. So the machine learning class one, um, today we are going to cover uh, a bunch of topics, uh, just um, a general introduction. And we have with us uh, a guest, Francois Chalet, who works at Google, and uh, we'll talk to him about uh, some of the many things that he has done and get some advice from him on how to approach machine learning and um, what kinds of things to look out for, what tools to use, and lots of other things that um, um, we will talk about. And then we'll go into covering what machine learning is, what neural networks are, how do you actually solve a neural network, and a general introduction to just what autoencoders are and what a convolutional neural network is. So uh, it's going to be a general introduction today and just to get you uh, familiar with the terms and uh, names of these things. And then um, throughout the course, we will cover a bunch of these things. So right now, when you read these things, they probably don't make any sense to you. But by the end of this course, um, we all should have a good understanding of what these are. We'll use many of these things and you should be able to uh, actually utilize in your own projects um, and then be able to explain to others what all these things are. So just uh, before we begin uh, housekeeping, uh, all the materials that I am presenting today, they are available in a Google Drive. The shortcut to that is uh, available here as a link and also as a QR code. So you can go to that drive and bring up this slide if you want to. Uh, and there are also a couple of um, Python collab notebooks that uh, you have access to there. And after the lecture, you can talk to me directly on Twitter or and then ask questions or ask questions here in the chat as well. So housekeeping out of the way, let's um, give a big welcome to Francois, who is joining us today from Google. Um, Francois has um, done a lot for the machine learning community. And um, by introducing us to Keras and through his books and talks, and is active on Twitter, giving advice not just on machine learning, but on life in general. His comments are pretty pretty and uh, very informative in general. Uh, but uh, for me, it, it's been uh, a joy to use Keras uh, within TensorFlow initially as version one extension, and then when it became part of TensorFlow full. So we're going to talk to uh, Francois. Francois, big warm welcome from SIGGRAPH ACM and uh, from me personally. So very Thank glad you for the intro. Hi, everyone. So I'm Francois. Thanks a lot for the intro. And it's my pleasure to be here with you today and to answer your questions. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, dive right into it. So I just wanted to find out more about like what your journey has been. Uh, how did you start and uh, get into the field? Um, and anything else you want to talk about um, about your journey? 
Yeah, sure. So my journey into AI, so initially um, as a student, I had uh, lots of different interests and I had kind of like this philosophical interest in, you know, uh, uh, the mind, the nature of consciousness, all these uh, uh, fairly uh, fuzzy and abstract things. And so I took a look at neuroscience initially uh, because, you know, that's, that's the logical uh, field uh, to look at if you're interested in the mind. And I was kind of disappointed by um, what I found. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a super fascinating, super interesting field, but it doesn't really have like answers about what is the mind, what is consciousness and so on. And this kind of led me, uh, I also had an interest in programming, so it's kind of led me into uh, AI, right? Which uh, at the time, you know, AI was was not really, it wasn't really deep learning, it was, it was mostly uh, things like, you know, GMs, uh, the ESTA algorithm, like well, all these different things. So it was very much, you know, uh, computer science, a subfield of computer science. So I graduated with a major in computer science and a minor in, rob in robotics. And uh, so eventually I kind of ended up doing uh, a little bit of research as a student in cognitive developmental robotics, uh, which was kind of like the subfield of AI that was the most interesting to me, which is uh, uh, basically about uh, using um, simulations and robots to try to model the early stages of human cognitive development. So at the time it was like the subfield uh, of AI that was the closest I felt uh, to, to trying to understand the human mind and trying to model the human mind in software. And from there, you know, I kind of followed the gradient of demand. Uh, so I went into more practical applications like recommender systems and so on. And I ended up working in the industry. And around that time, deep learning was taking off. So I, I you know, basically started doing uh, increasingly more deep learning and then started working on Keras eventually. Wow, that's a fantastic um, journey. So um, let me ask you about uh, Keras in particular. Like um, for me, um, when I first started using TensorFlow, it was like super hard for me to kind of switch into this data centric model of how to use things. And my mental representation of what layers were, they wouldn't map properly to TensorFlow. But uh, when I was introduced to Keras, like this, totally made sense because my mental model of what layers are, how they combine together, that fit perfectly well with Keras and I fell in love with like using the tools. Um, so can you describe like how you came about like um, coming up with that idea and uh, how you implemented that? Sure, I'm, I'm glad you find it useful. Uh, in terms of, you know, how Keras came about. So first of all, I think you, you're making a great point about mental models. Uh, I, I think, you know, um, a great API is an API that just reflects, that matches the mental models of practitioners in the field. It's a language that enables you to express how you think about problems. And it has to be, it has to speak your, your, your language. So the API is all about how you think about it. It's not about how it's implemented under the hood. And that was probably, you know, kind of a flaw of uh, the early days of TensorFlow that it was very much uh, it kind of forced you to learn about computation graphs and basically the, the, the low level implementation details of, uh, of uh, how TensorFlow works. And not so much, it wasn't really a language to talk about deep learning the way practitioners and researchers want to talk about deep learning. Uh, in terms of how it came about, so uh, Keras actually predates uh, TensorFlow. Like not, not too many people remember that, but initially it was built on top of uh, a different framework, which was called uh, Tiano. Theano was like the original OG uh, symbolic computation graph framework, which was developed uh, by uh, the Mila lab uh, at the University of Montreal. Uh, and it was really a, a visionary framework. Um, so inspired probably by, uh, by uh, an empire to grad uh, originally. Uh, it, it really you know, uh, laid the foundations for all the big ideas um, that would eventually become TensorFlow. TensorFlow is in, uh, in uh, many ways kind of like the successor uh, to Tiano, uh, uh, much more than the, the successor to an empire to grad. Um, yeah, and uh, I was basically just building Keras uh, um, as a personal project because I wanted something like that. Um, so back then, which was early uh, 2015, there weren't too many uh, deep learning frameworks available. If you are doing computer vision, the, the obvious choice would have been Cafe which was very popular, it was the most popular deep learning framework at the time. Um, and it was so C++ based, and it was really into this mindset that a model is a, a static configuration file, uh, a YAML file. So you write a new model by defining a YAML file. If you have to do anything, 
uh, outside of the scope of what you can describe in your YAML file, then you have to write your own C++ code. Uh, that was Cafe at the time. So I didn't really like it. Uh, there was also uh, Torch 7 that was available at the time that I used as well. So Torch 7 had a much, much more you know, modular approach, uh, which I thought was interesting, but it was also very, uh, very buggy, and it was uh, written in Lua. So if you wanted to, to use it, you had to use Lua, which I thought was not a great choice because it lacked the very extensive ecosystem that Python had. Like if you needed to write files uh, or read files uh, in a new data format, like you know, HDF5, then you had to write your own parser in Lua because there was no library for it. Because Lua, you know, really didn't have the sort of data science ecosystem that Python already had at the time. So it was like, you know, we need something that's uh, uh, that, uh, that enables you to define models as code as opposed to models as a configuration file, which was what every framework was doing at the time. Like um, there was also another one called uh, uh, Pylon, I think, which was also no, not Pylon. Right. Well, th there were there were a few, but they were all like you know in this mindset that your model is a configuration file. So I was like, you know, actually the model should be code, and then it should be in Python. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't really uh, 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 too many frameworks like that at the time. And I was also doing uh, uh, natural language processing back then, so I was interested in uh, recurrent neural networks, LSTM in particular. And there was like no uh, uh, open source reusable implementation of LSTM available. So Keras was like the first framework that brought all these different ideas together and that made available you know, a, a, a nice and reusable LSTM at the time. And then, uh, uh, so I put it on GitHub, it started getting tra traction, so I just kept, you know, hacking on it uh, uh, for the next few years. And it just uh, basically kept getting traction and eventually it got merged uh, into TensorFlow at Google. Well, that's that's a great peek into the history of it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your book? Um, I hear you have a new edition uh, coming up? Or? Absolutely, I'm currently wrapping up uh, the, the second edition. It's been uh, a lot of work. It's been a lot more work than uh, I anticipated. Um, yeah, so I wrote uh, uh, the first edition in uh, 2016, 2017, uh, and uh, um, you know it was badly in need of an update because the field has changed a lot uh, mm -hmm. in the past few years, and uh, the Keras and Tensor APIs have also changed a lot. So uh, I spent the past uh, couple of years kind of like writing the updated edition since the release of TensorFlow 2. Before that, I was really working on on the release TensorFlow 2, so mm -hmm. that was very much a full time job. Um, and uh, yeah, so the draft uh, of the second edition is finished. So I'm just basically polishing it now. Uh, it's going to be released on the publisher's website pretty soon. And after that, uh, the book will go into production and it will be available. Uh, basically, you can uh, actually read it in a, a paper format, uh, probably you know, by the end of this summer, maybe uh, early fall. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's uh, great. Actually, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you, you mentioned the field is changing pretty quickly. So uh, what uh, advice would you have for um, people listening to you right now? Like um, what kinds of things they could focus on or learn from? Um, and I, I'll also ask uh, uh, whoever is listening uh, to send comments and then we can have a couple of questions for you directly from the audience also. Sure, yeah. So yeah, the, the field is obviously you know, moving very fast. Uh, at least parts of the field are moving very fast. So for instance, uh, best practices in terms of uh, what architectures, what model architectures to use, that's, that's evolving very fast. Um, the transformer architecture, for instance, was uh, uh, a, a big revolution that made basically uh, recurrent neural networks pretty much obsolete for natural language processing. And, uh, and it was very established for the past couple of years. And now, you know, increasingly there are uh, attention-free architectures uh, that, that, are, that are showing up. That, that might be, you know, the, the next stage uh, of deep learning architecture. So architectures are kind of like uh, uh, going through these uh, uh, cycles every year, every couple of years. Um, and my advice uh, uh, to you as students is don't focus too much on the fast changing layers like architectures, for instance. Really focus on the fundamentals, mm -hmm. on the big ideas that basically don't change. Like, we, what we've been doing for the past like five years, ten years, is very much just you know training these big parametric differentiable models with gradient descent, and that's kind of like the foundation. And there are many different ways to structure these models. That's the architecture, mm -hmm. and that's something you know you can always bring new ideas. Uh, uh, it's not super important, 
that's not the part that really matters. What really matters is like the fundamentals, and in particular, the mental models uh, that you use to understand these fundamentals. If you have the right mental models, uh, uh, you know, built from first, first principles, then you can very easily uh, uh, understand new ideas, incorporate new ideas that you read about, like on archive and so on, uh, uh, into your, your understanding of things. Excellent. So again, um, uh, anything in particular you're working on that you can talk about uh, currently? Yeah, so I'm still working full time on Keras. Um, mm. So we have uh, lots of things in the pipeline. In particular, so we are working increasingly on a new uh, domain specific uh, packages like Keras NLP for NLP, uh, Keras CV for computer vision. Uh, we are working on all kinds of things, really. Okay, that's awesome. Again, um, I want to thank you for your time. I, I know we're a little bit um, over time, but uh, thank you so much for coming on and uh, talking to us. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks a lot for inviting me. All right, thank you. And you can stick around or leave if you want, and uh, we will continue the class. Um, Thank you again, Kansa. Thank you. Bye. All right, so that was uh, Francois. Uh, it was great to hear from him. Um, uh, and as he said, the field is changing pretty rapidly, um, but the fundamentals remain the same. And what we want to focus on are the mental models of how things are and we'll go back to the first principles a bit. And that's what we'll be doing. Um, most of this course is trying to give you an understanding of what these um, neural networks are and what the mental models um, are for those and what distributions are and how we are trying to basically predict a sample from uh, a distribution. Um, so to give you the big picture of um, uh, what AI and machine learning is, and this is um, borrowed from um, uh, a, a good book uh, on deep learning um, by Ian Goodfellow and Joshua Benjo. Um, so this diagram basically says that there's not just a small uh, neural network component, but there's like all these things like big data and AI and data science, data mining, and machine learning kind of connects to all of these. And what you really want is, is to solve a problem, right? So a neural network by itself is, is not any good unless you're using it to solve some kind of a problem. And, and that comes from getting the right kind of data, uh, looking at the statistics of that data, analyzing it, look, doing some data visualization. And all of these kind of help each other in a way where you, when you build your neural network and train it, um, you get some predictive value in the neural network. And then, and that's not enough that you got to deploy that thing. So you got to deploy it to actually solve the problem at hand. So, so it's a whole chain of uh, things uh, in, that includes big data and um, uh, learning to understand the data, visualizing it, and then trying to predict uh, from it. So, so that's, that's the big picture that I um, want to emphasize on. So. So what kinds of problems are you trying to solve? So there are, essentially there are two things. One is um, regression, which is where you want to predict a value. And the second is classification, where you want to figure out uh, whether something belongs to class A or class B. Um, but then we can solve many kinds of problems in different industry um, using these techniques. So the AI or the ML task that I list um, uh, in the column there, um, those are kind of um, specified as detection or classification segmentation, but essentially they are basically regression and classification. And you can use that to solve all kinds of different problems uh, in different industries as I have listed here, and we'll go into detail into solving some of these um, throughout this course. So, um, what is um, a neural network or machine learning type um, problems that you want to solve? So um, you don't want to use this for everything. When you have simple rules or algorithms or computations, you can just solve that directly. So for example, uh, you, you don't solve for the equation of uh, sine x because it's a known formula. You can just compute it. Uh, you don't need machine learning to do that. So um, you, the problems that you want to use machine learning for, um, they are 
problems that, that are not easy to solve using some if else clause or some rule based solutions, or the model is too complex or has too many factors. So for example, if you're trying to predict home prices using um, some factors, and you can imagine what those factors might be that affect home prices, uh, zip code, and square footage, number of bedrooms, um, you know, all those things go in, but then you don't know which factor has what kind of effect. So that model is, becomes complex, and those are the right kind of models to use for uh, a machine learning um, problem. Um, again, if you if you have to scale to a large number of inputs or large number of factors, that's that's the kind of problems you want to solve using AI. Uh, Rajesh, we had command. Could you put your slides full screen if possible? Sure. Thank you. There is that better? Absolutely. All right. Thank you. So how do we go about solving a problem uh, with machine learning or neural networks? So um, first thing you want to do is to figure out what do you want to predict really? What kind of data are you observing and, uh, and what you want to predict? And then you start collecting data. So collecting data means you can do surveys. You can generate some of the data automatically. Uh, you can um, um, do all kinds of things to collect data that you need for your problem set. And then after you collect the data, you need to probably clean it. And because the data may be coming from different sources, um, you it may not be the right units. It may not um, have the correct uh, format. And so you want to clean it up and prepare the data for analysis. So you do some data analysis after that, visualize, try to see if you can make some obvious connections between the data. Can you eliminate data that looks um, similar or is not serving a purpose that um, that some other data already does. So um, you do some data analysis that is preliminary, and then you organize your data and process that into features. So you transform your data uh, so that it is able to better predict that. Maybe you want to uh, take your data and uh, fit it into some different range or different units. Um, or maybe take a square of the data. The other things that you may need to do to kind of process your data so that now you have a set of features that you can train with. So next, what you do is you try to build a model. So this model will be um, in our course and would be mostly a neural network. And this would be the model that you learn from. Um, and then you feed the data to the model. So that part is called training. And you feed the data, try to make the model learn from the data. And then you evaluate the quality of the model. If it is predicting properly, if it's uh, not being able to predict, then you may need to adjust your data or your model uh, and then uh, continue the training process. And then finally, you start predicting. So once the model is trained, you, you can use that model to make predictions from new data that the model has not seen before. So, and, and then ultimately you deploy it. So uh, to begin with, let's um, use a simple example. Um, uh, again, going back to the home prices. Um, so we're trying to predict um, home prices from just one factor, that is the number of bedrooms. And we collect some data, and that data is presented here in this graph. So number of bedrooms is on the x-axis, and the home prices are on the y-axis. So you can already see that there is some kind of linear relationship between these data points, where the home prices tend to increase as the number of bedrooms increase. And um, so that, that's an obvious linear relationship, because you can see that there is a, a line that is almost diagonal that runs through it, which uh, means that home prices do tend to increase with the number of bedrooms. So because there is only one factor here, we can uh, perform um, uh, something called linear regression, where we try to fit a line through this data. And um, we would um, try to fit a line, um, and it could be any line, right? So we try to see um, this line that is closest to most of the points. How do we figure that out? So there's a mathematical process that we can employ, uh, because um, we want to choose this line that is uh, kind of predicts most of the data it's close enough to most of the points. 
and we want to minimize um, the distance from each of those points somehow. So that process is called linear regression. And um, the way it works is um, you take a line. Um, the equation of the line is y hat ax plus b, and where a is the slope of the line. So um, you're trying to find which line should you choose. And the actual points are y i's. So the green bars that you see here, they are the errors. So they are the errors from what the line predicts and what the actual values are. So what you're going to do is you're going to square the differences so that uh, the sign doesn't matter um, and sum them up and then try to minimize that sum. So, so what essentially you're trying to do is imagine it's like a magnet that is attracting uh, a line. And um, when it is optimal is when this total sum of this squared error is minimal. So it's never going to be 0 because it, it's an estimate, right? Because it's uh, not going to pass exactly through all the points. So we want it to be as close to the points as possible um, or in a way that minimizes this uh, squared sum of errors. So if you look at the squared sum of errors, it, it's actually uh, a, a quadratic equation, right? So which means that what you get um, is some curve like that, that you are some surface like that, that you're going to try to minimize um, in some way. So, so that's the idea behind uh, linear regression. You're minimizing the error. Uh, and then the way you do it is, um, is uh, an algorithm called gradient descent uh, with neural networks. And we'll go over that in detail. So. Um, what we can do now is um, if you look at the equation of the line, uh, we can represent this as a network. So it's a very simple network where uh, you have two nodes, I1 and I2. Um, those, um, um, and imagine there are some weights, uh, W11 and W12. And those can be linearly combined to form the equation of the line. and um, and that gives you uh, something like this, uh, where um, the variables that, that you assign to these uh, kind of become um, the equation of the line itself. And not only that, but you can represent this as a matrix multiplication, right? So it's a um, I1, I2, uh, and then you take the component-wise multiplication and sum them up, and it comes back to this value. So. Everything that we do ultimately will boil down to some kind of a matrix operation or a tensor operation in TensorFlow. Um, and that's what we'll be using. So um, we've taken a linear equation and represented it here as a very simple network of two nodes um, that um, uh, linearly combine into uh, an equation. And then ultimately, they become matrices. And it's a simple matrix multiplication. So all throughout, most of the computation we'll be doing is internally represented by matrices or tensors and simple matrix multiplications in general. So when we predict um, the set of points and we fit a line through that linear regression, and here we have uh, a set of points which quite uh, don't fit a straight line. So in the first graph that you see where you have a curve of degree one, which is straight line, it doesn't quite fit the points. Uh, it's close enough, um, but it's not the right one, right? You can already see that it misses most of the points, um, um, and the error is probably going to be big. Um, there is um, a degree two curve, which um, is much better. It, um, it fits most of the points pretty well. Um, and on the right side is a degree 20 curve, which uh, you may think that it is um, very good because it fits most of the points almost exactly. But that is something that we tend to avoid. Uh, we don't want to learn the actual points. We want to have predictive value. So um, in general, um, exact fitting of the data is not preferred. Because what happens is the neural networks then tend to memorize the data, and they lose the predictive value. So in general, we would prefer something like a degree two curve for this particular set of data, and um, and that's what we'll be doing. So, so when you have overfitting, like the 
diagram uh, on the right, um, you, you don't want that. So the way we do move from linear regression to um, something that um, is a higher order curve, we introduce some non-linearity. So this non-linearity is um, introduced by something called an activation function. And um, usually these um, are simple functions because they're used so much that you want them to be as fast as possible to compute. So uh, here I'm showing you uh, two um, of such activation function. One is called sigmoid, uh, which has an equation uh, like so, and it's a uh, S-form curve. And a faster version, uh, something called rectified linear unit, um, which is very fast to compute because all it does is max. And then by introducing this nonlinearity, we are able to do not just linear straight lines, but uh, any curve really. So, uh, so this is, you'll see that uh, again and again, an activation function added in to every node uh, to introduce nonlinearity. So next thing we can do, we take our network. So you saw the network um, that was simple like that. And then we're going to go ahead and um, add um, more complexity to it by adding more layers. So this is uh, basically the same network we had before, except now we've added a hidden layer. Uh, which introduces more weights and more activation functions. So you can imagine this um, big um, network of um, linear combinations of weights um, and inputs that are going to be um, computed and then output um, uh, as values. So, so this is a general structure of a fully connected neural network. But fully connected, we mean that every node is connected to all the nodes in the previous layer. So for example, the first node in the hidden layer uh, up top here um, is connected to every node in the previous layer um, through this. So as you can see, uh, as we increase the number of nodes, the number of connections uh, increases exponentially. And pretty soon, the network becomes very complicated. So this combination of uh, hidden layers and activation functions um, give us the ability to predict almost any function or compute almost any function that we want to. So, so this is very similar. The structure is very similar to how um, a biological neuron behaves as well. So you get these inputs, um, uh, and then uh, which are basically um, your data that is coming in, and then you have some activation function in between and then you get some output. So this is the basic structure of a biological neuron from which um, we have adapted um, a, an artificial neuron that we call it artificial neuron, um, what we use. OK, so um, when I said like um, a simple network that was fully connected um, is actually all you need. So that is um, enough to solve any function. So it will approximate. Um, almost any function on a compact subset of um, uh, of real numbers. Um, and this is a complicated theorem, um, which is kind of beyond the level of uh, my math um, to even explain. Um, but, um, but you can uh, trust that when I say that, that a simple network like the one I showed you is capable of solving any um, equation um, or any continuous function. Um, and what that means is that um, that's all we need. So if we have enough data, and um, if um, our network is dense enough, we can pretty much compute anything we want. Um, but the downside of that is that you need a lot of data. And then as you saw, the connections of a fully connected network, they grow exponentially. So the larger network you have, the more memory you would need. Uh, and more computing power you'll need. So um, most of the stuff that we'll be talking about, they are basically ways to avoid a fully connected network um, to make sure that we can compute things um, um, in the resources that we have uh, in terms of computing and memory. Uh, and then there are special cases for images um, where CNN or a convolution makes things um, faster. 
and we'll go over those as well. So having said that we can solve any um, mathematical function, there is also something called a no free lunch theorem, which says that if, um, if a neural network um, can solve, so it, this is an optimization of a network, right? So if, the, if we can solve a narrow problem uh, pretty well, then it's going to not perform as well on other problems. So which means that we cannot have a generalized solution for all problems using a single network. So each network is special. It will solve a narrow problem and uh, it will do it very well. And that's our goal is to make it do as well as it can on that narrow set of problems. So, so these are the kind of um, mathematical theorems proven um, and, and we can um, assume they hold correct and they do. Um, and we're not gonna go into the proofs of these, they get complicated in mathematics and it's not necessary for this particular course. So now we get to um, the practical aspects of things, like how do we actually solve this network, right? So, so what we will do is we'll set the weights of the network uh, randomly initially, and then um, we'll make a forward pass through the network. So imagine the forward pass basically means you take the weights, you take the input, multiply them at each node, and then apply the activation function, and then go on to the next node and do the same thing. So at each um, pass and at each node, you are going to take the input, multiply it by weights, and um, and then apply the activation function and so on, uh, keep moving forward. So that's a full forward pass through the network. And then um, when you get the output, you compare it with the expected results. So um, it's um, when you are training, you, you need to have some kind of a, a ground truth for each of the inputs where um, you compare the output to this expected result so they won't match initially so there'll be a difference and that is your loss and um, then what you want to do is you want to adjust the weight slightly based on that so you adjust your weight slightly and this process is usually done via something called gradient descent and back propagation in the neural network and we'll go over that in detail how we do that and once you change the weights by a small amount you repeat the process so you keep doing this uh, more data, compute, uh, repeat, mm, fix the weights a little bit, and then keep repeating the process um, until the error starts reducing. So um, through this feedback loop, um, the error will start reducing. Um, hopefully, if your parameters are correct and your data is um, varied enough, um, you will start getting um, a model that is stabilized, and then training is complete, and the error is minimal. So once you have that, then you can start um, predicting from this. So once you have that fixed, then you can start putting in new values which the network has not seen, and you can make predictions from the network. So that's part of the process of solving a network. And um, as you get into that, there are some terms I want to introduce. And um, again, the process remains the same. Um, just the names of how we do things, they change. Um, so as input, you will be given um, data and attributes. So the features um, is what we call them, sometimes X, sometimes attributes, and the output of the network is um, sometimes Y or labels or the ground truth. So the output um, usually satisfies some equation Y equals FX. And um, you have the network itself, which we will call the model. And the loss function is how you find the difference between the expected output and the computed output. Um, and that is your metric or the cost. And activation function we already covered. It adds nonlinearity to this. And some examples of this are sigmoid and um, and rectified linear unit, and you'll hear more about the different kinds of activation functions, but these are the two um, most used, and we'll use those. And then there is the training bit. Um, the training is also called fitting sometimes. It's the process of optimizing um, to minimize the loss function via back propagation. And then you evaluate the model, whether it's performing correctly, whether it's performing fast enough, it's correct or not, and then, um, and then there's um, 
the prediction that you do on the new data, uh, which is also called inferencing. Um, and um, you'll hear these terms again and again. And these are kind of like the part of um, the toolkits that we use um, or uh, different papers that you read. So get familiar with these terms uh, that are underlined and you'll hear them again and again. There are basically, um, again, the process is simpler um, and but there are terms that uh, are part of the vocabulary of the field. So uh, I work in uh, computer graphics in animation. And so there are a lot of different applications that um, exist um, for computer graphics. Um, um, you may have seen papers about this or videos on YouTube about how you can do um, character AI um, in games. Uh, you can do style transfers. And we'll go into detail about style transfer how you can make uh, um, a very um, perfect slow motion videos out of uh, normal videos, how you can up res um, uh, videos or images uh, from low res to high res. You can remove noise from images. You can try to understand via text processing a sentiment of a review or a story. Um, you can do most of the computations from that go from rough to fine. You can use probably machine learning to, to do those kinds of things. You would have seen um, 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 on iPhones, you can use this um, face tracking and uh, emojis that kind of track your face uh, and expressions. And then uh, using GANs, we can use um, GANs for image generation of different kinds, and we'll go into that detail as well. There are multiple applications in the computer graphics area, and not to mention several other areas of medicine um, and finance, um, and pretty much any field that you can see today, machine learning uh, um, can help um, make the results better or find new applications that we haven't seen before. So um, we'll take a little bit of a pause, and uh, I can take some questions and just want to get the pulse of like how things are going, if uh, people are uh, with me so far. And um, um, we have about 15 more minutes left, and I'll cover some hands-on programming, because I want to get you using the tools as well as um, um, trying to get your hands dirty a little bit. So if you have any questions, um, if I'm going too fast or too slow, uh, let me know and um, we'll fix that uh, next time or as we go along. So I'll pause for a bit, drink some water, and wait for some questions. Looks like there are no questions so far. All right, so we have a question about, um, given enough training, does activation function matter? In other words, is activation function an optimization for training, or does it more influence than just speeding up training? So the activation function, the primary purpose is to introduce non-linearity. Because um, without that, we will only have linear um, things. Uh, we, want, um, we want to be able to have functions that are non-linear. Um, that approximate the data. So um, once we know that we need an activation function, we want the activation function to be as fast as possible because it's going to be applied at every node. So the choice of activation function um, is either sigmoid or inverse tan or um, the rectified linear unit. They're, they're all equally good. Um, the Rectified linear unit tends to be faster, and that's what most of the people use. So again, the choice is more about how fast it can be computed. But overall, the purpose is to introduce nonlinearity. All right, so let's move on to the hands-on uh, part of the class. Um, so we will be using um, this Python virtual environment called Colab from Google. And Colab is a Jupyter-derived Python IDE. Um, and it has TensorFlow support built in. And 
there are a bunch of other tools we'll be using that will help us uh, to plot and look at data. Um, again, um, these are standard packages that most of the machine learning community uses. Um, TensorFlow is something that I'm familiar with. Um, you can use PyTorch or other mm, frameworks that are equally good. Uh, but this is what I'll be teaching um, in the course. So if um, so I have another question about, uh, could you please elaborate a bit on the pros and cons of using Keras versus TensorFlow versus PyTorch for computer graphics purposes? So, so I have um, no particular recommendation um, because they all work in a similar way. Uh, Keras, I find it um, easier to use than directly using TensorFlow. And Keras is uh, now a first class citizen of TensorFlow. Uh, so the way you think of layers in convolutional neural networks in computer graphics, they map pretty well with Keras. And um, I've used a little bit of PyTorch, and, and it's the same. I think it's just a different toolkit from a different vendor, and they work pretty well. A lot of the machine learning community, um, I can see they use PyTorch or TensorFlow equally. Um, so it's not, uh, it's whatever you feel comfortable with, whatever, um, mapping is easier for you um, because they are both available uh, in Python. Uh, it's more about like your comfort level with the API itself. Um, but the things that we will do, um, they they are pretty independent of the toolkit itself. All right. So um, if you haven't already, uh, you can go ahead and open uh, the housing.ipynb collab file. And um, if you're using this for the first time, you may need to associate the collab app with the file to make sure that um, uh, it, it does work. And um, what I'll do is I'll switch uh, to using a different tab. And the notebook should look something like this. And make things bigger. OK. So this is the notebook that you should be seeing. And, um, and please make a copy of the notebook in, um, in your own drive. And um, it should work pretty well. So um, I hope you're all familiar with Python. So this is basically just an IDE that lets you do Python in a web browser. And it's pretty powerful because it all works on the Google Cloud directly. And it shows you um, what kind of uh, machine you have. And you've got a runtime that is on the cloud with some memory and some disk space available to you. Um, and then I think um, after the class, you can try to get familiar with the actual interface. Um, it's pretty standard for an IDE. Uh, you also have access to um, some sample data here. Uh, you can add more stuff. You can connect this directly to your Google Drive if you want, and you can put in more data. Uh, and so I think take some time to get familiar with the, um, with the interface. We'll be using this a lot. And you can do markup. You can type text and code and interleave everything in between. And you basically get executable cells that you can uh, type things in. So. And then um, hopefully you're familiar with Python as well. And this is how we import some of the packages that we're going to use, um, which is uh, NumPy, Pandas, Matplot, and Seaborn. So um, we're going to basically execute this uh, cell. And this part gets executed. And we'll read the data. So here we are using um, a publicly available data set for housing. And um, you, the way you read that with pandas, um, and what you can do is you can um, click on this, and you get some help on the API. So the read, read CSV, uh, it, it's a 
function with uh, hundreds of parameters. And all we're using is the file name. And then we're saying the separator in the file is a comma. So it's a CSV or a comma separated value of data. We're going to read this data from the web directly. And um, let's execute this cell. So data is read as a matrix. And we can print the different um, calls that you can make. So this is not a call. You're just calling the attribute on that shape. And it shows you that um, there are 17,000 data points. Um, and there are nine fields. So we are reading basically a matrix of 17,000 by nine. And we can start looking at the data itself. So the head um, is going to uh, returns the first n rows of the object. And n by default is five. So this is going to print the five, first five rows. So as you can see, there are five rows. And you have. Uh, nine attributes. The dot dot here means the data is not printed, but is there. So um, we want to be able to see all this um, nine attributes that we read. So um, what we can do is we can transpose this and then look at um, look at those um, attributes. So um, the same call as before, except we are transposing it this time. And once you print that, you'll see that here are the nine attributes. So. Um, each data point basically has a longitude, latitude, the median age, total number of rooms, total bedrooms, population, households, median income, and median house value. So and you can look at um, some of this data, try to see if it makes sense. Um, the age uh, of the house of, is probably in years. The total bedrooms, uh, this looks a little suspicious um, because it's pretty large. Um, so. Um, you would know this just from reading it, but this actual data is for blocks. So it's blocks in um, in the state of California. Um, so each block um, will have a total number of bedrooms. So this each row basically is not a data per house, but a data per block. So that's why you see the total bedrooms as um, as, as pretty high in some regions. So, so that's the basic data. And most of the time, you'll get data that is not as clean. So you'll have to clean that, remove some empty rows, and look at that. So you'll use um, pandas to kind of uh, figure out um, that part. You may want to remove bad data or uh, replace something. So don't add data manually, because that's um, you don't want to bias the data. So you always want to remove things that are not available. Uh, you may want to remove some outliers um, that look like obviously bad data collection or some typos or transcription errors. But you most likely don't want to add data manually uh, that you don't have. So we can also look at the statistics of the data. Um, as we saw, there's uh, 17,000 uh, data points. And that's the mean of everything, and the standard deviation, minimum, and the different percentiles, and the maximum. So, so that's a good way to kind of look at uh, whenever you have data, um, basic, do basic analysis. So this is um, just simple analysis. Um, uh, so we can also using um, Pandas API to look at just two of the variables. So, so two of the factors um, that go into the data, latitude and longitude. And as you can see, um, we have basically a general variation of latitude and longitude. It makes sense uh, because this data is coming from California, um, that these numbers kind of are for the region of California. So next thing we can do is we can plot and try to make more sense of the data. So for that, we're going to use something called Seaborn. In Seaborn, we had imported as SNS. And we are going to do a relative plot of latitude and longitude versus the total bedroom. So the size of each dot in this graph is the um, total bedrooms. And the x-axis is the latitude, and the y-axis is longitude. So we plotted all this data. And uh, as you can see, uh, it maps perfectly to the map of California uh, because we are plotting latitudes and longitudes. And it should geographically map into the map of California. So you can see the density of the homes, where they are. Uh, you can see the empty regions. And you can tell um, 
where they might be. This is the desert area. This is the middle of California. Uh, so this is probably Sequoia National Park where there's no uh, houses um, with that much density. Um, so um, this is basic way of just plotting data, making more sense of it. Um, another thing we can do is uh, plot. So these are just two of the variables, latitude and longitude. You may want to plot all of them against each other. So there's something called pair plot, which will take each attribute and plot it against the other and itself. So we're going to take uh, 1,000 data points and then plot them all against each other. So this will take some time. Um, There you go. So there you have uh, basically a matrix of plots uh, with um, the parameters on the left side and the right side as well. And they are essentially plotting uh, against each other. So this is one other way to make sense of data. You see obvious relationships. Um, one thing you'll notice is on the diagonal, because uh, plotting uh, something against itself uh, uh, is not very useful. So what um, Seaborn does is it gives you the distribution of the data instead on the diagonal. So you'll see how the data is distributed. So with the other non-diagonal elements, um, the plots are um, against another parameter. And as you would have guessed, um, this whole thing is probably symmetrical around this diagonal. So if you look at any other graph, um, they should look pretty similar. Um, so one thing you'll notice that uh, we have uh, longitude, and if you look at um, latitude versus longitude here, this is no longer the map of California. So what happened? Um, anybody you want to take a guess without reading ahead? OK, since you're running out of time, so I'll cover this. Um, uh, so what happened, we took the first 1,000 data elements. So when you said, give me 1,000 data elements and plot them against each other, um, the first data elements may not be representative of the entire data set. So that's why you don't see the map of California. So, so that's something you want to be mindful of, that when you're processing data, that it is always representative of the entire data set because you're taking samples from a data set that may not be listed in, in a random order. So there may be some process to this data that we got where first 1,000 elements are not showing the map of California. So what we will do, um, again, same thing, except this time we're going to take a random sample. So instead of taking the first 1,000 data elements, we're going to take 1,000 elements, but randomly sample them. So let's try that. There you go. So now if you look at latitude versus longitude here, um, it is, again, a nice graph of uh, map of California, uh, even with just the 1,000 points, because we selected randomly. So it does represent the rest of the data of uh, 17,000 points. So I'll stop here, because we are out of time. Um, and um, hopefully, we did cover most of it. And we did that. We looked at the code. So next time, uh, we will cover the general networks and what they are. And we will actually get into TensorFlow and do some regression. So what I want to leave you with is um, that we, we got to talk to Francois today. We um, understood what neural networks are, uh, how they are basically um, representing a simple linear combination. Uh, and then when you add the activation function, you're able to represent nonlinear things as well. Um, and then we played with some data. What as a small homework, what I want to assign to you is to try other data. Try other data, play with some um, different plotting mechanism. And if you have questions, um, you can um, uh, send me a Twitter message, um, or you can um, 
um, put it here in chat. And if there are any other questions in chat, what we will do, uh, our volunteers will collect them and I'll answer them at the beginning of the next class uh, when we have time. So hopefully this was a good gentle introduction and we'll get things um, in motion from the next class onwards and pace will pick up. Um, so I'll see you next time. Thank you.